Good afternoon, and thank you for coming to Alabama Brides a Short Engagement. This is a presentation of the latest exhibit at the Alabama Department of Archives and History, focusing on three bridal gowns within the archives collection. I'd like to first thank the staff that helped put this together. Kathy Logan, Jordan Ann Connor, Shailen Mayo, Meredith McDonough, Haley Aaron, all very enthusiastically supported this endeavor. But before we get started with the presentation, I'd like to give you a background history on why we started this exhibit to begin with. Um, several years ago, we received a donation from the Bishop Collection. And included in that was an absolutely gorgeous wedding gown designed and sewn by Emily Bishop. Mr. Bishop uh, unfortunately passed away before his wife's dress went on display, but he would always ask when we were gonna exhibit. So Mr. Bishop, this one's for you. Now, to begin, the presentation, we're going to take a look at a timeline of wedding gowns and discuss how fashion has changed through the eras. The majority of the photographs that you're going to see belong in the collection of the archives, although we did have a few gaps. What we did is supplement those with images from the New York Public Library image archives. The earliest image fashion plate that we found comes from the 1770s from the New York Public Library's collection. And as you can see, uh, wedding gowns basically wore the bride's best dress. And there was no thought to this being the dress that they would wear once and never wear again. It was basically their best dress that they would continue to wear throughout its lifetime. But that changes in 1840 with Queen Victoria. Queen Victoria bucked the system when it came to royal traditional bridal gowns. She wore at what at the time was considered a simple white gown decorated with flowers and minimal jewelry. In fact, uh, our modern day conception of bridal dresses goes back to Queen Victoria. Yes. Really? Yes. Isn't it great? It is. <laughs> uh, she um, wore a heavy silk satin gown with minimal jewelry and uh, the emblems of the Order of the Garter, which you can see in the image here. And she also wore uh, a wreath of orange blossoms instead of the crown jewels. So this was simpling down of a tradition. But this was a love match. In fact, Queen Victoria was known to have said that this was the happiest day of her life. And our next slide shows the actual dress on exhibit at Kensington Palace, along with her slippers. Now, why did what she wear become so popular and create this tradition that still lasts years afterward. Well, uh, with modern technology in the 1840s, her image circulated the globe of her and her wedding dress. And as you can see on the portrait on the right, that is her actual wedding portrait in, painted in the 1840s. And then on the right, we have the lithograph that would have been seen in newspapers across the world. By 1846, you could see the tradition has changed in the fashion magazines. This fashion plate on the left shows this change from everyday best dresses to this symbolic gown. And the white gown, of course, symbolizes innocence and purity. In 1861, we have uh, Godey's fashion plates and goatees for women of the Victorian peerage period was like the vogue of today. This is a combination of 
uh, helpful tips and fashion uh, plates so that women could follow the latest fashion. Was Godey's a magazine? Godey's was a ladies' magazine in the 1860s. Well, it actually goes back until the 1830s. So, on the left, we have the original Tallulah Bankhead in 1866. She was married in Wetumpka, Alabama. Now, she is the grandmother of Tallulah Bankhead, the movie star, and the mother of our second director, Marie Bankhead Owen. Tallulah Bankhead is one of my favorite women in that era. <laughs> and she's really, she strikes out and becomes, you know, I, they, she's one of the women of the era in the 20s, man. That's, she's gained fame in Europe. Yeah, uh, she was definitely a personality, and yeah. one that I would, I would love to have her confidence. Um, oh, the image on the left is from our collections, and the image on the right is another fashion plate, just showing how bridal fashions followed the fashions of the day. Another image from our collection on the left is of Hattie Hall in the 1880s. And to give you that idea that they are following the fashion on the right is another Godey's fashion plate with a dress almost identical to Hattie Hall's. The left is also um, an image from our collection. It's from one of our previous directors on his marriage in 1904. 1910, um, the image on the right, is a wonderful display of how important the wedding ceremonies became. Here you see the entire wedding party has their photograph taken <laughs> to commemorate the event. After World War I, there was a change in fashion, a dramatic change. You um, go from the tightly corseted and tailored look to a lowered waistline and higher hem line of the 1920s. And here we have a wonderful transition of fashion from the late 19th century and the corseted, very tailored looks to a lowered waistline and a lifted hemline of the risque 1920s. The image that you see before you is Emily Casamon Lig Lignan, who uh, was part of the original family that lived in what is now the governor's mansion. You also see a transition in bridal accessories here. The bouquets for brides have gotten enormous by this time. On the left, we have another image from the 1920s. In the 1930s, um, that transition in style, you have a lot of the fad of the day dresses being cut on the bias. And the bias is a 45 degree angle cut in the fabric that allows for greater stretch in the fabric. The difficulty with dresses from this period is that if they are kept hanging in a closet, the bias tends to stretch over time. So dresses from this period need to be laid as flat as possible. But also in the 1930s, you see uh, with the Depression, uh, common practice of women wearing their mother's or their grandmother's wedding dresses. So while you have a wedding in the 1930s, the clothing is from the 20s or earlier. With World War II, you see a transition in bridal gowns as well. Again, it becomes more of the best dress because uh, women are concerned more with the union of marriage itself rather than the dress. But by the 1950s, you see that great, wonderful look of the fuller skirts becoming more popular. 
By the 1960s, there's such a rapid change in fashion that dresses within the same decade look completely different. On the left, we have Betty Scott, which that dress still, the skirt has that wonderful uh, poofed look of the 1950s. And then later 60s, the slim down. Now, the picture that you see on the right is uh, Fred and Susie Sanders Hubbard. And their photograph was taken by a photographer for the Southern Courier, Jim Petler. This is from the Jim Petler collection. And his wife was the maid of honor that you see in the image. The picture that you see on the right is Ann Scott's sister to Betty Scott, which was in the previous slide. And you can see that transition from the big poofy skirts that have more of a 50s style to the slim, almost twiggy look that you see in fashion plates or fashion magazines in the later half of the 1960s. Our picture on the right is a board member, Garland Smith, in her wedding dress in 1969. The 1970s see a wonderful transition in not only the political and socioeconomic atmosphere of the United States, but fashion-wise as well. The picture on the far left is Peggy Wallace um, in her wedding gown in 1973. Our center image is the Savage Manor wedding. Now this, I'd like to point out, is a fun wedding party. Not only do the bridesmaids match the groomsmen, but they also match the carpet. And then we have on the end, Georgine Connor and her wedding in South Alabama in 1978. Now, there was a wonderful expression in the 1980s with color and style. Um, early 80s saw a more traditional look to the wedding gowns, but you see the emergence of the Mac weddings in our image on the right, which is um, a friend of the archives, Miss uh, Sunshine Huff and her wedding in 1989. She um, took a more Edwardian theme to her wedding and even used dried flowers in her bouquet. Oh, the 1990s. <laughs> well, I think everyone had a dress similar to one of those on the left. <laughs> um, and the hairstyle. Yes, and the hairstyle. Uh, but um, the era of not only matching accessories, but uh, even dyeable shoes. And then my own personal wedding photograph on the right from 1998. By the time the 2000s roll around, there is such a dizzying array of gowns available for the modern bride that um, customizing has become the newest trend. You can go into a bridal store now, choose a gown, but customize it to fit your own personal style. Now we'll take a look at what I consider the five iconic wedding gowns. Because Queen Victoria started the trend, she is of course our first iconic gown. Jacqueline Kennedy, the American royalty of the day, had a, a gown that symbolized this resurgence uh, in the 1950s of that Victorian flair to the skirt. Um, it, her dress also has an Alabama connection with Anne Lowe from Clayton, Alabama, who was the wedding designer for or the designer for the bridal gown. Grace Kelly was another American who became royalty that her gown was copied over and over again. And you'll see it, uh, a version of it here in just a moment. Prince 
Princess Diana actually brought the idea of big weddings back to the U.S. Um, with the aid of television, people all over the world were able to witness royalty marry. And the wedding industry saw a huge rise in bigger, grander weddings. In 2011, her son married Kate Middleton, who took the inspiration of her dress from Grace Kelly from the previous slide. Now let's take a look at wedding gowns from the archives collection. The first gown that we have is an 1830s wedding gown purported to be the dress of Mrs. Israel Pickens, a first lady of Alabama. This has wonderful features, as you can see here, with a crossover surplice bodice pleated with the material and stylized cuffs. This is a fantastic gown you know, because uh, the leaves that you see here just sparkle in the light. Another First Lady's gown is uh, this 1840s wedding gown from one of Alabama's First Ladies. And it is a wonder of construction. This uh, bodice has layers of individual strips cut on the bias, that 45 degree angle, to give them more flexibility and stretch. And they're applied to the bodice. This gown is entirely hand sewn, made out of silk taffeta. Here's another image of the bodice itself to give you that layered effect of those strips of the fabric cut on the bias. This um, construction had to be, the construction of the bodice had to be done on a pillow shaped for the wearer so that the curve of each of those strips of fabric could be placed correctly. So this was built from the bottom up. And on the right, you see an image of the first lady that wore it. And her name was Eliza Brown Allen Watts. Our next slide is a recent acquisition to the archives, and it was lovingly named the Hippy Dippy Wedding Dress by the owner. <laughs> uh, this is an early 70s, 1972 uh, wedding dress made by the bride's mother in Tuscaloosa, Alabama. According to our uh, donor, she and her mother argued continuously <laughs> over the dress and at, per 1970s fashion, she refused to um, have her hair uh, done at the hairdressers. And so she wanted wild hair and hippy dippy dress for her wedding. Now we're going to take a look at the, bri uh, the bridal gowns that are on display here on the second floor of the archives. Our first is the Steinecker gown. From the collection of Helen Steinecker, this silk satin and lace wedding gown is typical of the silhouette of the late teens. Uh, it has a raised hemline, a lower waistline, and a draped bodice that exemplifies the period of transition from the tailored silhouette of the early teens uh, to the drop waistline column silhouette of the 1920s. Uh, the use of lace on the bodice is subtle, but it used a lot, utilizes the scalloped edge of the lace as a decorative feature at the neckline. Uh, the use of the scalloped edge is also seen at the bottom of the sleeves. What's very interesting about this as well is the little orange blossom, a little throwback to the era of Queen Victoria. 
And according to the language of flowers, the orange blossom represents innocence, eternal love, marriage, and fruitfulness. The bishop gown comes to us from the Matthew Borum Bishop Collection. And this is the, um, the reason that this exhibit uh, began. In April of 1953, Emily Bishop began the process of making her wedding gown. She gathered inspiration photos together, which came to us with the collection, uh, made a list of what materials that she needed, and went shopping. And in the end, she made an absolute confection of Chantilly lace and satin. This is an absolutely beautiful gown with the exception, with the exception of the shoes is made entirely by Emma Lou Bishop. The picture on the left shows how intricate she got when it came to putting this gown together. The covered buttons are layered in each section going from satin covered with a net over that to the net being covered with lace. How long did it take her to make that? That'll be, that's coming next. <laughs> she even cut pieces of the lace out and applied them to the bodice, which you can see on the picture on the right. She even made the headdress that came with the wedding gown. But what was also incredible is that we have the list of materials when she went to the store. So we know exactly how much yardage and fabric went into this dress. Not only that, we have the receipt that shows us how much she paid for it, which was $60.23. Using an inflation calculator, that comes to a little over $500 in today's money. But in less than 60 days, she put this wedding gown together. It's a possibility. It's incredible. <laughs> so another interesting thing that came with our wedding gown from 1950 from the Bishop Collection is that it was, she was actually concerned about preserving the gown past her lifetime and actually sent it to the heirloom conservators, and we have the certificate that you can see here, where they cleaned and stored the wedding gown in acid-free tissue and acid-free box in 1953. Our next gown, or our last gown, is the Lipinski gown. As I mentioned before, the array for of bridal gowns for the modern bride is dizzying. And it's all about customization. Here we have Caroline Lipinski in her wedding, Maggie Sotero wedding gown. There it is. This dress also shows that tra tradition or transition from traditional to more modern, uh, where before the wedding gown. Uh, symbolized innocence and purity, we have the bride's personality coming out. Um, and and um, where we have a little more demure now, we have a bride being allowed to feel sexy at her wedding. This strapless A-line gown by Maggie <laughs> Sotero is made with an ivory satin base and lace overlay. The lace is applied to net in almost a uh, ombre pattern where it's scattered more at the bottom and more concentrated near the bodice. It also has the ability to train in the back so that when the bride is ready at the wedding reception to move around, she can take the train and bustle it up. Wonderful details on the gown are these the corset lacing in the back, and the wonderful beading and sequins, iridescent sequins that you can see throughout. 
But the shoes, oh, the shoes. <laughs> we have uh, Babsy Mishka shoes, which match the satin in the gown. So, best practices for preserving textiles. If you are looking at preserving your wedding gown for future generations, here are your best practices. When storing the gown, always use acid-free materials. Store the dress as flat as possible in a cool, dry place, away from light, heat, and humidity. These are what we call agents of deterioration. If textiles need to hang, use a padded hanger. This will alleviate some of the stretch on the fibers of the gown, especially near the shoulders. But it's especially important not to hang textiles that are knitted or textiles that are cut on a bias because those are more apt to stretch over time. I'd like to thank you for listening in to this presentation. But special thanks go to the sponsors of this exhibit and the event. Flowers by Buck, Chappie's Deli, Denson's Bridal, The Keen's Table Catering, Jim Massey's Cleaners, Sweet Tooth Creations, Brindle Rentals, Baumhauer's Restaurant, and Sensei. And a special thanks again to the staff who very enthusiastically responded when I said, I want to display the wedding gowns. Thank you again.